Something I'll just pull it out. 
We'll start uh, in two minutes at 9.40. Sure. Uh, good morning. Um, let's get uh, let's get started. I hope uh, you all enjoyed the snow, the storm, or at least were not greatly um, disadvantaged by it. Um, we are going to continue our discussion today. Today, our topic is economic growth, um, how to think about it, uh, why it matters, um, and what are the the policies and institutional context uh, in which uh, it happens. Um, we will continue in our usual fashion of um, a dialogue and exchange. Um, I'll, I'll start today and then I'll stop in a little bit and then uh, Roberto will pick up and we'll exchange and we'll open it up in our usual way. You can't hear me? Can't hear you. Okay. Um, I hope the uh, the microphone should be, uh, this is on. Is it is it at the on? Is it can you hear me now better? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try to speak up a little bit more, uh, but uh, if, uh, do, um, do raise your hand if you don't hear me, okay? Okay, um, we start with economic growth, uh, not because we are uh, growth fetishists or we think because economic growth uh, is the end of uh, human advancement. Uh, but because we think economic uh, growth really matters and has mattered a lot in history. Um, so actually th the first question I want to address is um, why should we care about economic growth in the first place? Um, I think uh, we should care about economic growth uh, because it is very closely associated uh, with improvements in, in human well-being um, in uh, a lot of its dimensions. If we think about access to education, um, access to um, health, uh, health outcomes, um, even um, uh, life satisfaction. Um, when you ask people uh, whether they are satisfied with their lives on a scale of one to 10, and this is um, somewhat dicey, uh, but we have a lot of different ways of measuring this. Um, it turns out that overall economic growth or the level of per capita GDP or level of income is actually very highly correlated uh, with all these uh, good things. Um, the world's greatest 
uh, poverty reduction experience ever is the one that was experienced uh, in China uh, in the four decades uh, since uh, the late 1970s. And that was, by and large, a product of very rapid economic growth. Uh, interestingly, this was a period when in income inequality within China rose significantly because this process of economic growth did not benefit all parts of the country equally. The coastal regions uh, benefited more. Uh, urban areas benefited more than the countryside. Nevertheless, uh, the improvement uh, in the lives um, and the reduction in poverty uh, in some of the uh, poorest parts of the country happened sufficiently rapidly uh, that the bottom uh, rose very significantly, even though it did not rise nearly as fast as uh, it did in the richest parts. So that if you look at, for example, if you compare over the last four decades, um, China, a country where income inequality significantly deteriorated, uh, with many other countries, developing countries, low-income countries, that also start with relative from relatively low starting points, where income inequality did not deteriorate, but they also did not actually experience rapid growth. In fact, the poorest people in China did much better uh, in terms of uh, improving their material uh, life conditions and their life chances than the poorest people in other parts of the region, in other parts of the world where, in fact, income inequality may not have increased um, uh, uh, nearly as much as it did in China. Uh, this is not to suggest that there is a necessary tension between economic growth and inequality. I don't think there is. I don't think either one of us believes that there is a tension between growth and equality. It's just to make the point that when you have rapid growth, a lot of good things become possible even for the least advantaged uh, in society. Uh, now, you might think that this is all about material well-being. Um, I mentioned earlier that even if you ask people about their psychological state of mind, their general uh, approach to life, and I think um, the best, even though not perfect or quite imperfect, I should say, measure of general happiness is the question where people are asked, um, uh, how do you rate your, um, your what's the exact, your, your general life satisfaction on a scale of one to 10. Um, and then there are large scale surveys, both over time and across countries. Um, and it turns out quite interestingly that not only people generally report that their life satisfaction on this scale uh, is much higher in richer countries. Uh, it's also that as countries get richer, the average reported life satisfaction by these surveyed respondents increases. So there's actually, even within countries, there's evidence um, that um, economic growth increases overall life satisfaction. We will discuss problems with climate change later. This is one area, in fact, we are running into some uh, significant problems that growth is creating insofar as growth relies on carbon. Um, but if, even if we take a broader view of the environment. There are many dimensions of environmental change where, in fact, higher growth has improved the environmental quality. And clearly, one such area is uh, airborne pollution or the quality of air. Um, and there is no comparison um, of the quality of air uh, in um, London around the turn of the um, uh, industrial revolution compared to today. Uh, for example, there is a significant improvement uh, that there is something called environmental Kuznets curve, which suggests that as countries get richer after a certain point, many aspects of pollution actually uh, become, uh, uh, are, 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 are improved. Uh, climate change, again, is an area where there is an issue with respect to carbon use, and we'll come uh, to that uh, later in the course when we discuss issues of climate change. So economic growth is an instrument. We care about instru economic growth because it um, has uh, produced um, a lot of um, the things that, that we actually care about. 
and therefore if we want prosperity that is inclusive, uh, it becomes a lot easier to achieve in an environment where there is growth uh, than when there isn't growth. That's point uh, number one. Um, uh, a few facts about economic growth. Um, I'm not going to be uh, showing you a lot of charts. Uh, there is a set of background slides for this discussion um, uh, that you can see uh, on the course, uh, on the Canvas website. But I just want to mention three important uh, growth facts uh, to frame our discussion. One is the central role in history of the Industrial Revolution. That is that if you look at our best indicators of overall incomes, uh, stretching back many, many centuries, it essentially is with minor dips and increases, it's sort of flat over many centuries, then something happens during the late 18th century. Uh, it's nothing um, dramatic. There's nothing like a, a single year at which the income curves tend to, over time, starts to um, uh, turn up. In fact, if the 18th century had not been followed by the 19th century, it's quite possible that we might not have picked up that there was a something called an industrial revolution in the uh, late 18th century. But it does continue throughout the 19th century. If you look at the, this chart of incomes per head over time, it's clearest in Britain where the industrial revolution originated, that there is this flat course of income and then it starts to pick up gradually, but does it de definitely does. And there is an increase in this, um, the trend uh, growth rate of income from roughly around zero per year uh, to something that in the long term uh, will be around 2% per year in per capita terms. So after the Industrial Revolution, uh, countries um, where the Industrial Revolution takes place and countries to which the Industrial Revolution spreads, such as the United States, um, Western Europe, um, very few um, non-European or non-North American areas, but including Japan, long-term growth rates are roughly of the order of 2% uh, per capita, uh, uh, which is um, uh, significantly different from than, than zero. And that's essentially, it's the, you know, the, 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 the long-term consequences of the Industrial Revolution. The second important growth fact um, that we should bear in mind is uh, the process that's called the Great Divergence. Um, the Industrial Revolution, as I said, does spread to Northwest Europe, um, to North America, um, in the late 19th century to Japan. But for vast um, areas of the world's geography, um, the Industrial Revolution uh, does not reach there. So this process of long-term economic growth, what the economist Simon Kuznets called modern economic growth, this growth rate of 2% per capita per year over the long term, it's a characteristic of the advanced parts of the world, while uh, the periphery parts of the world that we call the South today essentially remain largely um, uh, um, uh, unaffected in terms of growth possibilities. They're also they're obviously affected because of the uh, implications of what's happening in the, advanced in the advanced world, the forces of colonialism, imperialism, um, all of that, of course, is our, um, uh, both symptoms uh, and reinforcement uh, of the fact that the world gets divided uh, into a core and a periphery. And that's what the great divergence is, this big difference uh, in the economic fortunes of the center uh, and, and the periphery. And as I said, very few countries, in particular very few uh, um, non-European or North American countries um, uh, are able to um, access the Industrial Revolution, Japan in the late 19th century being the, the, the major exception. 
That's the second important growth fact, the great divergence. Um, the third one is much more recent, and it's a much more hopeful one. Um, in fact, it's a process of economic convergence between the poor countries and the rich countries that started um, sometime in the late 80s, early 1990s. Okay. Think of this as the experience of the last three or three and a half decades prior to the pandemic. Um, this great divergence actually pretty much um, continued until the late 1970s, the late 1980s. So that is to say that developing countries continue to lag behind what today we've come now come to call the developing countries um, and the countries that started to decolonize after the Second World War continue to lag behind uh, the countries of the center really until um, uh, the early 1990s in terms of growth rates. But then the trend begins to change. The most important um, uh, factor underlying this trend change is, of course, what's happening in China. Now, there were some other East Asian countries that had began to grow very rapidly um, in the late 50s, early 60s, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, some Southeast Asian countries in the 1970s had, begin, had begun to uh, pick up growth. But really, the major transformation comes with China because China is such a huge country and you start, can start to see it in the aggregate numbers uh, when you divide up the world between a rich uh, core and a poor periphery. Um, but the experience in China, uh, which is associated with what I called earlier um, the, the greatest poverty reduction experience ever in history, um, is uh, followed by uh, less significant but, but still um, uh, uh, noticeable pickups in growth rate uh, in a number of different countries, different regions as well. India, of course, after the 1980s, uh, leaves behind the uh, so-called Hindu rate of growth, it's a very low growth rate, starts to grow very rapidly. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America after the 1990s um, start to grow more rapidly uh, than uh, they have um, in, 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 in their history. So when you take the developing countries as a whole, uh, there is now, after the 1990s, a period of convergence. Um, that is essentially now has been interrupted by the pandemic. And the expectations are that at least for the next few years that most low-income and middle-income uh, countries in the world are going to be growing less rapidly than the advanced countries. And we may come to um, the, um, both the causes of that and some of the implications. Um, before I, 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 I turn over to, to Roberto, I want to make um, some comments about how economists think, how they think about the factors that lie behind growth. Because that is then going to be a prelude to the important discussion we want to have about the policies and institutional arrangements to promote growth. Okay. Um, economists uh, tend to uh, uh, um, distinguish between different uh, sources of economic growth. Um, these, you may want to think about these as the supply side mechanisms that drive growth. Um, to put it very crudely, um, you can divide the sources of growth on the sup supply side to two categories. One is simply the inputs, the capital that goes into producing overall economic output. Those are the inputs. You can think about capital very broadly. It's not just machinery. You can think about it as what economists call human capital, which is sort of education and skills. You can think about more broadly about land. 
You can think about it as natural resources. But those are all the inputs that go into producing economic growth. Now, that's not the most important part of growth because those resources are necessarily um, finite and accumulating them is very costly. Uh, the second dr key driver of growth, and in fact what's responsible by and large for the Industrial Revolution and for all these other dimensions of growth, the other growth facts I've uh, just uh, discussed, is known under the generic term of total factor productivity, TFP. So think about economic growth being driven on the one hand by the amount of machines and education, land resources you throw into an economy. The second is the productivity with which the, those inputs, those resources are combined to produce GDP, to produce economic output. Total factor productivity. Productivity because it's a measure of how we're combining our inputs to produce GDP. It's total factor productivity because we're measuring in total how all our different factors of production, capital, education, land, all these factors are being combined. Okay, so TFP. So now I want to make sure that we understand in turn what TFP is. Because by and large, what drove the Industrial Revolution and what drives um, sustainable growth paths in other countries <coughs> is really significant changes in the behavior of TFP in those countries. Why? Well, because um, it is the productivity of the resources that you have that enhances both your GDP and also the incentives to accumulate those inputs of production. So let's say that land is fixed, but capital and education aren't fixed. But in order for people to save and to invest, in order for people to be willing to send their children to school so they get more education, they need to have some idea that those investments will yield a high return. That if you buy another piece of machinery, if you expand your factory, or you invest more in education, that there will be an economic return. And that becomes possible only if the overall productivity of the economy increases. In other words, only in a context where TFP is increasing. So after the Industrial Revolution, um, the incentives to accumulate increase. So one of the major transformations after the Industrial Revolution is, of course, the demographic trans the transformation. Demographic transformation is, in turn, in part a product of the increase in returns to education. Um, as more families want to send their kids to school so they can, return, they can earn an education, so they can be more productive, um, uh, the incentives to have more children uh, decline. Um, and birth rates begin to fall. Um, that's an important demographic social transformation that's driven by the productivity trends behind the industrial revolution. So TFP is important both because in its own right, because it increases the productivity with which a given set of resources, capital and education can be used and produce output, but also it's, it's important over time because it increases the incentives to accumulate those inputs increase capital, increase education. And then when TFP itself is increasing, of course you have this dynamic where increase in output, increase in productivity in turn gives incentives to further improve I investments in uh, capital and education and there is a ongoing dynamic of self-sustaining growth as long as you can maintain this process to total factor productivity going. So it becomes very important to understand what we mean and where TFP comes from. Now the chances are that when I mentioned total factor productivity, um, you linked it immediately with uh, technology and innovation. And that is in fact historically how, especially in the advanced countries, we have thought of TFP. And the original intuition comes precisely from the Industrial Revolution. Because what made the Industrial Revolution 
was the application of new ideas, the application of new techniques, new innovation in cotton textiles especially. And this innovation in turn made labor much more productive. It gave the incentives to accumulate machinery, uh, to create factories. In turn, these um, in, 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 in innovations were then, then spread throughout uh, the rest of the economy. Uh, these innovations were initially concentrated in cotton textiles, uh, but then um, uh, spread to other parts of the economy through um, sort of um, the steam engine, more efficient use of energy, um, uh, through railroads, um, to the steamship, um, and um, sort of the automation um, and the, uh, the process of, of um, uh, manufacturing and industrialization uh, that, that, that we've talked about uh, in the first class. So under the heading of TFP, uh, innovation is absolutely, technology innovation is absolutely critical. And that's what the Industrial Revolution was about. But it's not the only part. The other part is what we might call um, structural transformation. For an economy as a whole, structural transformation is also a key driver of total factor productivity. Um, how is that possible? Well, think of an economy um, where there is productive dualism. Uh, this might be, let's say, turn of the uh, 19th century Britain, where there is a factory system in some key towns, but in the rest of the country, uh, people are engaged either in, in sort of uh, craft production or guild production or are you know, less productive subsistence agriculture production. But sort of the, there is a productive um, dualism between the parts of the economy where the most advanced, most productive um, uh, technologies are being employed and the rest. Or it could be in a typical developing country, let's say in the 1960s and 1970s, where there is a productive dualism between um, urban centers where there has been some nascent industrialization, where the factories and technologies have been uh, imported and adapted from abroad, but uh, the vast uh, labor force um, is employed either in, in subsistence agriculture in the countryside or in informal services in urban areas without access to those productive um, uh, capabilities. So in these kinds of settings where there is productive dualism, a process of structural transformation, whereby you move people from the less productive employment to the more productive parts of the economy. There's this transformation, transforming, let's say, a, um, a farmer into a factory worker, increasing this farmer's labor productivity by a factor of two or three, simply um, is a matter of uh, transforming his or her occupation. This is going to also show up as an e economy-wide in total factor productivity. Um, although it is not fundamentally driven by increases in technology or increases in innovation, it is instead being driven by the expansion of the parts of the economy that have access or are employing the more productive techniques and absorbing the labor from the lower productive parts of the, econ uh, of, the, uh, of the economy. This traditionally has been the key mechanism uh, to overcome the great divergence. So for countries that have been far from the frontier, the main mechanism for achieving economic growth and converging to income levels or having more rapid growth has been not to invest in more R&D to, to come up with more innovation, but simply to absorb the innovation that already exists in the rest of the world 
and more importantly, to ensure that you can go on absorbing people from the countryside or uh, informality into these more productive um, production of, of, of goods and services. So it's that process of structural change, and structural transformation that drives TFP, not innovation per se. Whereas traditionally, under modern economic growth, the advanced countries, the countries at the frontier, the only way that they have been able to increase TFP is by um, actually investing in R&D and innovation. Because if you like an economy like um, the United States, for example, in the 1950s, there is no productive dualism to speak of because even in agriculture, you have highly technology intensive, capital intensive techniques of production being in place. So there is no significant productivity gap in the returns to labor at the margin between, let's say, the, an auto factory or a big grains farm um, in, um, in, in, in the Midwest. So the only way you can actually increase productivity is by simply um, innovation on R&D, um, new ideas and technological innovation that increases uh, the return to the resources that you have. And there's limited gains that you can have. And in fact, during this period, it's not that there weren't big regional divergences, uh, but a, a smaller scale version of what was happening, let's say, in South Korea, Japan, and China was also happening in the United States, uh, where uh, southern states, for example, which started with much lower levels of productivity because they were traditionally hampered both by lousy institutions and by um, sort of less specialization in manufacturing. Um, those, in fact, were converging in terms of productivity uh, to the northern states um, in the same way that some of these East and Southeast Asian countries were converging uh, to uh, the most advanced parts of the world economy. This story probably about sort of, you know, the TFP being driven by uh, essentially innovation and technology in the, in the rich world and uh, driven by structural transformation in the developing world has become less and less um, uh, relevant to describe the world, I would say, in the last uh, few decades. Because in many ways, the picture for the advanced countries has come to look more like that of the developing countries. Because the nature of technological change and the nature of structural change in the advanced world has um, started to take the form that we described in our, in our first class, where in fact uh, the benefits of these productivity improvements are, being, are, 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 are remaining uh, bottled up, segmented, um, with the dissemination throughout the rest of the economy happening less uh, markedly than it used to be. So this phenomenon of productive dualism is becoming much more a phenomenon of the advanced countries as well. So for example, this within country convergence between the south and the north or between lagging regions and uh, the advanced regions in the United States is no longer happening uh, since the 1980s. Um, that process of internal convergence has stopped and the process of an internal divergence has begun to, 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 to appear uh, where um, the workers who have lost their jobs in manufacturing, let's say, are not moving necessarily to higher productivity services, but they are moving to relatively less productive services. So in some sense, starting to replicate some of the features of a developing country where there is this sort of quasi-permanent split between uh, the more productive and less productive parts of the economy. Of course, with an important quantitative difference that in a typical developing country that most productive parts are relatively small islands compared to the rest of the economy, whereas in Europe or in the United States, uh, it might be a relatively larger part, although uh, the parts that are being left behind um, the phenomenon of either labor market polarization or regional divergence um, uh, becoming increasingly 
uh, more of a more of a feature of these economies. So there's a sense in which the structural problems and the problem of um, how do we get growth and TFP uh, that uh, characterizes developing countries and the advanced countries in some sense have become one and the same. Uh, in the developing world, the process of rapid industrialization is no longer working because industrialization is increasingly skilled and capital intensive, um, is no longer able to absorb large amounts of um, labor from the countryside. Um, so industrialization is no longer doing the job of, of uh, stimulating very rapid and sustained productive structural transformation. And in the advanced world, which had already begun to deindustrialize already by the 1970s, the new occupations, the new sectors that have arisen out of the new generation of innovation, ideas, and technologies have similarly not been particularly friendly uh, to labor, in particular uh, labor uh, with um, lower education levels. Not coming from, maybe we'll stop. Okay. Hello. <laughs> this is very hard. I think it's Roberto who's doing that. Can you, can you take, can you see? Construction going on somewhere. That's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was you. Wait, was it? <laughs> okay, Roberto. Next time you think I've gone on for too long, uh, <laughs> you can simply call. <laughs> okay. Actually, I'm going to stop here. Uh, we have not <laughs> I got the message. Um, so I, I've gone as far as talking about. Um, sort of the role of structural transformation um, in driving total factor productivity uh -huh. and therefore growth, um, and, and how developing countries and advanced countries alike are facing the challenge of um, increasing productive dualism because of um, uh, industrialization not working as um, it uh, used to in the developing world. But we haven't discussed industrialization as such, right? No, I think it would be good for you to, to take off there because I think that would be then uh, a, a way that we can start talking more about policy and institutional arrangements. Actually, I'd like to do something else first. Okay. Uh, which is, I'd like to take this category of yours of growth episodes and subsume it under a different or a larger category from the outside which I'm going to call National Development Projects. Uh, these episodes of growth, so yes. So let, me, let, me, let me just say this to connect. So I think that, that's good because that makes us talk about sort of the, the set of policies um, and practices that might lie behind what promotes or doesn't promote. But then we should get back to the question of industrialization okay. and what's specific about it and why it worked and now it doesn't work. Okay. So these growth episodes that you've described don't happen spontaneously. They are the product 
They are the outcome of the takeover of the state by national elites or by a counter elite within the national elite that creates a base in the country for a new national path. Uh, and the comments that I now want to make are all about that, that category of national projects, because I assume that they are the true authors of these development episodes that you described. Now let's take as an example, as a model for this, the Meiji Restoration in Japan in 1868. So a, a faction of the elite, a counter-faction, a counter-elite, as I call it, comes to power and attempts to reform the state, the society, and the economy in order to maintain the conditions of national independence, of economic and military strength. Now, there's a paradox in these operations. And the paradox is that in order to survive in this worldwide political, economic, and military competition, a country has to sacrifice part of itself. It has to go around the world and identify the institutions and the technologies that it needs. It has to give up part of itself in order to adapt them. It has to combine what it imports with what it had before. It's as if it had to give up the rings in order to keep the fingers. So in order to remain independent, or become strong, it paradoxically has to be less distinctive in the way that it was before than it had been up to then. So all the nations in the world, or almost all the nations, used to be tribes constituted on a basis of biological connection and cultural homogeneity. And now they're all in the process of becoming something else. And this something else is a kind of moral specialization. The nations are experiments in different ways of being human. But in this path, from the tribe to the experiment in a distinctive way of being human, an accident happens. And the accident is this evisceration of the concrete collective identities. So for the ancient Romans, for example, to be a Roman was to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans. The collective identity is tangible. And because it is tangible, it is porous and susceptible to compromise. And now the collective identities are in the process of being eviscerated of their tangible customary content and substituted by an abstract will to be different. And this helps account for the distinctive and peculiarly poisonous character of contemporary nationalism. Two nations live side by side, and they hate each other not because they are different, but because they are becoming alike and because they want to be different. Uh, this is the political and cultural reality that stands in the background of these episodes of growth. Now, the second comment that I want to make is this. Once one of these elites or counter-elites with its new base in the nation has established a course of national development, it has to protect it. So it has to have a shield. For example, a fiscal shield. It has to mobilize national savings, maintain a high saving rate, have a high basis of hard currency. All of this is very costly. And it characteristically trumps 
the reasons for, for example, the counter-cyclical management of the economy. So now it happens in the world that when the progressives lost faith in Marxism, they became Keynesians or vulgar Keynesians. And they think they can spend their way out of recessions, out of slumps. But the idea here is that you need a shield. You need the shield of heresy, of national heresy, to protect the national path that this counter-elite has established. Now comes a third characteristic of these episodes. The third characteristic is that It's not just resources and technologies that have to be mobilized, it's people. And each of these national projects of development creates its own base, its own social base. For example, the characteristic project of the 20th century, which was conventional industrialization as a, ba as a shortcut to rapid economic growth, was associated with the creation of a particular social base. The social base was the national bourgeoisie and the minority of the labor force, the so-called labor aristocracy, headquartered and employed in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy, industry. That was the, the practical social base of this operation. And every national development project is going to be like that. It's going to require that it create its own base. Uh, now I come to a, a fourth uh, attribute of these episodes. They are characteristically subject to what you could call the logic of the path of least resistance. So what I mean by the path of least resistance is this. There is a new set of technologies and productive practices in the world which the country wants to adapt and reinvent in its own image as an instrument of development and national strengthening. But it wants to adapt those innovations in the form that least disturbs the established dominant interests including the class interests, the interests of those elites that are conducting the process, and the established preconceptions about what is feasible, what is desirable. That's the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is the version of the national project that cuts the innovations down to size, that downsizes them to accommodate them to the dominant interests and ideas. Now, there's always some variation in this. How much sacrifice? And there's some contradiction. So the advantage of the path of least resistance is that it's more socially realistic because it requires less contradiction of the dominant interests and ideas. But the disadvantage of the path of life, least resistance is that typically it fails fully to achieve the potential of the innovations. It, it, it is a, it's an incomplete version of the innovations. For example, we're going to study later in this semester the knowledge economy in the form that it exists today, the insular knowledge economy. It's not economy-wide. It's caught in particular fragments of the production system as a fringe that excludes the vast majority of workers and businesses. The insular knowledge economy is a characteristic example of the path of least resistance. It's the version of the knowledge economy that is most acceptable and feasible given the social realities and given the groups that command the process of transformation. But there's always some variation in how much will be sacrificed, how much the necessary innovations will fail to be realized. Now, let's take the United States as a source of examples here. 
So at the time of the independence, the, the, the national development project was the Hamiltonian project. And the Hamiltonian project is a characteristic example of an elite, a counter elite seizing power and organizing the national development. So there was a literally the opening up of the country, its, its, its transport sector, the organization of the public debt by Hamilton through the National Bank of the United States as the financial instrument of this project, a very high wall of protectionism, which the United States remained committed to until well into the 20th century, after it had already become a dominant economic power in the world. And there was a particular cadre of politicians, bureaucrats, entrepreneurs, adventurers, who were the agents of this process. So you could say, well, that's a, a very clear example of the path of least resistance. Cutting the national alternative down to the size of this particular coalition of elite interests. But if that is all that had happened in the United States, we wouldn't account for the rise of the United States. This Hamiltonian project from the top coexisted with a movement of selective democratization of the economy down below. In the two sectors that were then most crucial to the American economy, agriculture and finance. So the Marxists and the conservatives all believed that economic progress would require agrarian concentration. That's what had happened in England. The Americans rejected the path of agrarian concentration. They distributed the public lands through the Homestead Acts, uh, and they created the most efficient model of family scale agriculture with entrepreneurial characteristics that had ever existed in the world up to that point. Uh, they ensured agriculture against the risks peculiar to it. They provided science and technology through the land grant colleges. Uh, and they organized the whole process of commercialization of the product. Uh, in a, in, in, by practices that in our vocabulary today, we would describe as decentralized strategic coordination between the government and the family farmer. And at the same time, among the family farmers, cooperative competition. They were independent proprietors, but they helped one another. They worked on one another's land. Uh, and they shared technological resources, silos, tractors, and so forth. Uh, and the result was the formidable dynamo of American agriculture. The second sector in which they did this was finance. So there was a conflict in the early 19th century in the United States over the National Bank as an instrument of the nascent financial plutocracy. And in the presidency of Andrew Jackson, it culminated in the dissolution of the National Bank. And for more than 100 years, the Americans prohibited any bank from operating in more than one state of the Union. They created the most decentralized system of finance at the service of the local consumer and producer that had ever existed in the world. So the United States was the product of the combination of these two movements, the movement from on top, the Hamiltonian development project, and this movement from below of selective democratization in the two crucial sectors of finance and agriculture. And that's an example of how there's room for variation in the definition of the social base of these national development projects. Now, the next thing that I want to say is that the world economy, 
the organization of the global economy that we call globalization and that has come in modern history in two main ways can be more or less hospitable to these national development projects. It is less hospitable if it requires as a condition for engagement in the world economy and particularly in world trade in the acceptance not just of the market economy but of a particular version of the market economy. For example, a version that outlaws under the label subsidies all the forms of strategic coordination between governments and businesses that the countries that are now rich use to become rich but that they want to deny to the latecomers. Or the world economy can be organized on the basis of a legal and institutional minimalism. That is, the maximum of openness with the minimum of restraint on the national institutional experiments, inc including experiments in the way of organizing a market economy. Uh, now, there's one more thing I want to say about these national development projects. A very widespread view in the world now is that, and a view that's shared by many of the progressives, including the progressive economists, is that the orthodoxy, which we sometimes call neoliberalism or the Washington Consensus, is universal. But the heresies are local. And each of these national heresies, the national development projects as such heresies, are composed of elements of the universal orthodoxy combined with local adaptations. So there'll be a Chinese way, for example, different from the orthodoxy. Uh, but this, was, this, is, this, this is not the only view, and this was not the only view. The view that Karl Marx had and John Stuart Mill had in the 19th century was that a universal orthodoxy can be successfully combated only by a universalizing heresy. It cannot be combated by merely local heresy. And they viewed their doctrines, the liberal doctrine or the socialist doctrine, as such universalizing heresy. And in our conversations during the semester, I am going to defend that position of a universalizing heresy as being necessary. But the question is how we can reconcile this idea of the universalizing heresy with the particularity, the distinctiveness of each national project. And here I want to go back to my first thesis about the nature of modern nationalism of contemporary nationalism. So the nations want to be different, even as their concrete collective identity is hollowed out. And there are then three responses to this phenomenon. One response is the response of liberal cosmopolitanism suppress the desire for difference. Everyone should converge. The second is the response of autarkic regressive nationalism. Protect national difference. But there's a third response. The third response is to say, equip national difference. And, the, and part of the meaning of this universalizing heresy would be to create the political and economic institutions that allow the different nations of the world to invent and develop new difference. And these national development projects should be one of the instruments of the creation of new difference. The premise is that these national identities are dangerous if they are the object of an intransigent faith, if they are incapable of compromise, of compromise. They become less dangerous if they become more fertile. 
The correct response, according to this view, is not to suppress the desire for difference, but to equip it. Difference is not the problem. Difference is the solution. And then we have to create this ability of the different nations of the world to become different. The differences that they will create in the future matter more than the ones that they have inherited from the past. So that then, Danny, is my proposal to take your category of the, the growth spurts uh, and subsume it under this other category of the national development projects and to think of it in that light. No, so that's 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 very useful. So I want to come back to I want to come back to uh, the idea of universalizing uh, 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 parity uh, because I think that's that's a very that's key. But before that, just let me let me back up. So you've talked about the national development projects as as being sort of what's behind the um, episodes of uh, rapid growth and, and sustained uh, convergence. So you gave briefly the example of uh, Japan after the Meiji Restoration. You talked about the United States. But just so, just so we're clear, so if we were to expand that set of examples, it would also include, um, let's say, the East Asian growth miracles um, in the sec after the Second World War. It would be most notably uh, China. Um, or imports substituting industrialization or, in South or, America in the second in the 20th century. Yes, that's very important because even though import substituting industrialization has gotten a bad name in recent decades, it is true that for a variety of countries, it did uh, it did um, uh, uh, create the conditions. It, it did stimulate growth over a period of three or four decades. That yes. was not so. In that group, I think. One would list uh, countries like Brazil, Mexico, Colombia uh, in Latin America, certainly Turkey in, in the Middle East. And for several decades, they developed a formidable industrial apparatus yes. out of nothing. Yes. So uh, the way that, 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 that I think about those uh, episodes uh, is that there are, there, are, there are a set of economic policies that are pursued, and behind those economic policies, there are a set of political coalitions um, that, um, that that pursue those policies. And I, I do, in fact, subscribe to the view that um, you try to, um, I wouldn't say dismiss, but uh, you try to go beyond, uh, which is that these successful uh, developmental or growth episodes are indeed a mix of what at the time is considered a sort of orthodox policy uh, with um, unorthodox or heterodox uh, policy arrangements. Um, and I think it's, it's important to, to specify in broad terms what that mix would have been, whether we're talking about Japan in the late 19th century, the United States um, after the independence, or these East Asian cases. I think in all cases, there is a kind of a reasonable um, uh, set of reasonably orthodox macroeconomic, monetary, and fiscal policies in terms of price stability, in terms of overall debt sustainability. Um, so it doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're full of, of policies of austerity or you necessarily target extremely low inflation, but a reasonable um, environment of macroeconomic and fiscal stability um, it seems to be a precondition. And to that extent, uh, there is a certain parallel uh, with the dictates of an orthodox position. I think there is also, in all of these examples, a certain degree of attachment to the importance of private initiative, private entrepreneurship, private investment, and ensuring a sort of policy institutional arrangements that don't necessarily constrain it to the degree to which uh, all private initiative is squeezed out of the economy. But Again, just, but just a footnote there. Uh, because we, you're giving that as an example of orthodoxy. So I would say the orthodoxy now in the rich North Atlantic countries is the orthodoxy that combines the standard economic policies with Keynesianism. Uh, so counter-cyclical management of the economy in slumps. And I would claim there are all sorts of situations in these developing countries 
in which the attractions of that orthodoxy are trumped by the, by the requirements of rebellion. It is important for a country and for its state not to be on their knees before the capital markets, not to need financial confidence. And therefore, it may be the case that they have to apply, quote, austerity, even in conditions in which, in the rich countries, Keynesian countercyclical management would be called for. But they apply for austerity not in order to gain financial confidence, but for the exactly opposite reason so that they not depend on financial confidence. So there's, there's two views on that. I mean, I, I, so the, your argument is that basically in countries, especially in today's world, where we're the financially globalized world, where finance and financial confidence uh, plays a very important role, um, that some nations might actually uh, try to shield themselves from uh, financial sentiment by, for example, um, uh, increasing domestic savings to such levels uh, where those countries would no longer be dependent on the goodwill of yes. financial markets and the confidence. But I think, you know, th that, I mean, uh, there's, there's one, there, there are two counter arguments against that, one about whether you need that, and the other is more a counter-argument about the feasibility. Suppose that you're right, that you need that, that there are reasons that financial markets uh, 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 may keep you on too much of a short leash uh, if you're trying to depart from um, uh, orthodoxy, and therefore uh, you need a shield against that. Um, then I don't think simply policies of um, increasing savings would be adequate because what you need to protect yourself from is not sort of reliance on net capital inflows from, but from growth inflows. As long as there is two-way inflow, uh, simply having a large savings and therefore following is not enough. Is it may be necessary, but not sufficient. You know, so you can have yeah. as big a public. Uh, government surplus and you know drive down your public debt yes uh, but as long as you know, the, you know domestic you know domestic investors can leave um, and then uh, that's not going to be enough so yes. you would need to complement that with uh, you know very wide ranging policies of um, capital controls and insulation and financial yes. financial insu uh, financial repression um, which I think the consequences of which might be worse than the long-term consequences. But yeah. I was what I had in mind was the initial but steps of a process of but rebellion. But let me let me let me try to you know give you the other counter argument, which, which I think is more hopeful, which is to say that I think financial markets don't particularly care about orthodoxy and heterodoxy. Yes. Um, financial markets only care about whether the economy is growing, there are private investment opportunities. Um, and I think that's the hopeful answer because the exactly. it's, it's economists and the IMF that care about whether it's Exactly, or exactly. And that's what so the Latin American countries didn't understand. Right, so but, that, so that, but that, that means then that, you know, this is not an additional constraint. Uh, that it means that financial markets, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a point that I've been making, um, you know, for example, you take a, a country like the experience of Turkey in the last decade. It's been one, you know, irresponsible economic policy after another by the standards of any orthodoxy. But because the country has managed to keep growing and because the regime in place has managed to keep uh, sort of profitable investment opportunities because interest rates domestically have been high, the carry trade has provided a lot of investment. Yes. So that they've benefited from a very you know, elastic supply of foreign finance. Yeah. So financial markets don't care whether you're orthodoxy or not. They care about whether you're producing results in terms of- In the medium know, term, yes. In the, sh in, the, in the medium term. So that's why, I mean, then, then the question really becomes, if you're following a successful development strategy and a growth strategy, are you, are you, are you pursuing policies and changes in institutional energy that's going to produce that 
not, to, not least for your own people as it is for you know, investors in your market. Yeah. So I, the tension might be a lot less in, in, in that way. But that's kind of a, a footnote on our discussion. Yes, about but there is something, there is, there is a, a more subtle and more general point, which is all of these successful episodes, which I, I would call the national development projects, they were essentially plots. They were conspiracies uh, against the dominant order, uh, they require rebellion. They, 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 they require some contradiction. So the, 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 the Latin American countries in the second half of the, of the 20th century were the ones that signed on the dotted line. They were the most pliant. Uh, and they, they didn't understand what the Americans understood in the 19th century that uh, in history, rebellion is not always rewarded, but obedience is invariably punished. And so that, that, that is, the, is the central principle that has to be appreciated. Yeah. So in my terms, I would say that the countries that were successful were the ones who, you know, once again took the orthodox model to the, to the degree to which it provided the appropriate enabling conditions, but then added on it a layer of their own institutional innovation uh, that were um, highly contextual, um, uh, were highly targeted to their own specific circumstances that um, unleashed economic energies and economic dynamism, often through unorthodox policies. And then you've listed some of these in the context of the United States, um, you know, certainly in the context of, you know, Japan. Uh, Japan relied early on um, to a significant degree of, of state intervention. It could not protect its economy by tariffs because of uh, Commodore Perry's previous uh, excursion there. Uh, but um, the Japanese state created its own factories. There was, you know, as modal factories to, um, to bring new uh, textile technology to, uh, to the country. Um, subsidized and otherwise, otherwise incentivized private firms. Um, in, in the, in the post-war examples of you know, South Korea and Taiwan, there were a um, very wide range of industrial policies and export incentives and, and state ownership once again, particularly in Taiwan in the intermediate in, uh, goods industries, uh, which ran against sort of, if not the orthodoxy of today, certainly the orthodoxy of today. Um, China, of course, was a very interesting mix of uh, the orthodox and the heterodox with a lot of you know, uh, institutional experimentation to achieve fairly conventional ends of how do you get private investment and exports going, but doing so uh, through things like you know, special export zones or dual track pricing or township and village enterprises, uh, very sort of China-specific uh, uh, policies. So that's what I mean by this sort of second layer of highly uh, contextual arrangements. Now, where that evolves is the question about universalizing, you know, heresies. Is that that question I want to come back to? So we agree. You know, our terminology might be different. We agree that these national development projects are 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 are, are, are a kind of a, a mix of um, conventional ideas and very unconventional uh, remedies, and they are pregnant of you know, sort of a certain dynamic evolution of institutions that might take these countries, not necessarily to full convergence to some sort of free market ideal, what that might be, but a kind of a, a national difference um, that in turn perhaps the global economy might equip or not. So I want to uh, understand more what this idea of a universal heresy might be. Um, if it is, I mean, if it's universal, it becomes a new orthodoxy, no? I mean, it becomes an orthodox. So tell us a little bit more about, did the United States become, had, what's an example of that? Or, or let us, make us, you know, help us think about what a So I, So I would say, for example, looking to the future of our argument, that uh, the creation of a high energy democracy, which organizes democratic politics to make change not depend on crisis, 
and the development of an inclusive economy-wide knowledge economy that doesn't confine productive vanguardism to a series of exclusive fringes are elements in a universal orthodoxy. But they're compatible with a wide range of difference. That's what I meant by equipping difference. So that the, the impression of contradiction or paradox fades when you begin to realize that the idea is that these institutions of what I'm calling the universalizing orthodoxy are the ones that render the creation of new difference possible and fertile. Uh, just, I, stated as such, I mean, I don't disagree at all. So uh -huh. the, I think the, the idea is more terminal, maybe so my, my my doubts had to do more with, with uh, terminology than, so the idea. But, but, but the problem is that this goes against the logic of the paths of least resistance. Uh, well, if I understood you correct, the path of least resistance provides sort of a way of to move forward, but doesn't necessarily foreclose the possibility of cumulative structural change. N but it, it, it always understates the, the potential of the transformation. Huh? So, uh, I mean, let's, going back to the United States, to the American example, so let's go forward to the, to the 1920s, for example, uh, and the development of the car industry in the United States. So Alfred Sloan, who put together General Motors, said, the purpose of the corporation is to make money, not just motor cars. On the other hand, Henry Ford said, the purpose of the manufacturing corporation is to produce. And if that objective is kept, finance becomes a secondary consideration. And so he developed the discourse, which he called producerism, which is very close to what we are going to be calling in this semester productivism. And he associated producerism with the ascendancy of production over finance and mass consumption. So high salaries, the, a, high, a high return to labor as the practical economic base for this system. So that was, as it were, a conflict about how downsized the path of least resistance would be. Now, up to now, Ford has not been on the winning side of this struggle. But it's a struggle that continues. And that's the point, that there's this, there's this range in which the, the, poten the transformative potential of the new productive practices and technologies is always understated by these compromises that the elites establish. And so what the opponents of the established order have on their side, despite all the difficulties they face, is this unfulfilled potential of, of the compromises. The compromises are not fulfilling the potential now of the knowledge economy. Um, I, I, I mean, I wonder if the difference in practice is is less that there is, you know, fundamental differences in in those two. For example, taking the Sloan versus Ford uh, difference as to uh, differences I I about instrumental differences about you know how you get there, rather than differences in objectives. Um, because I think if let's say if economists today, or technocrats today, or policymakers today would say, no, no, actually making money is the objective of the corporation, uh, it's not necessarily they think that that's the objective, that's where, you know, that's the measure of social value, or that's, you know, the reason that an economy should operate. It's because they think that it's only if the corporation is, is obsessed with the idea of making profits that the economy will, in fact, grow will produce all the good things 
uh, that it ought to produce. And that if, uh, if instead producers were obsessed with production, uh, um, that they might then, in fact, uh, you know, invest in things that look uh, technologically very advanced or, 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 or gadgets that look fancy, uh, but if they're not you know, making money because then it won't be you know, satisfying the wants of the economy and therefore it actually would not be producing the kind of growth. So it, it, I mean, there's, there maybe it's a kind of a contrived example, but the point I, I, I'm making is there is between, the, between your position and what you characterize as the sort of the orthodox position of today, I, I don't think there is that much difference in terms of the overall objectives. And the, the, it seems like the difference is much more in the tactics. Um, and, 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 and for example, with respect to you know, finance and production, I don't think any economist today would say that finance should not be a servant of production or that finance should not be a servant of the economy or finance should not lead the economy. Well, but the test, the, the test but, is but the institutional it, detail. It is, but because there, but but the disagreements are about the details, about whether you know, how the financial markets actually work, and what are the settings in which you could make them work better. Well, well, not that, not in the objective that ultimately you want to, um, you know, expand the production. No, product. not quite. So, so the detail. It seems to me the 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 subtlety of the controversy is that the controversy always has to do with the relation between the institutional details and some general conception. So for example, the still dominant general conception with respect to finance and the capital markets is that if a capital market is perfectly competitive, it will by definition allocate resources to their most efficient uses. And if it's not doing that, it's because there's some flaw in competition and symmetry of information and so forth. Or in the regulatory response, to the localized competitive flaw. That is denying that different institutional arrangements can either tighten or loosen the relation of finance to production and to the real economy. So there's a real theoretical object of discourse. But the significance of that object of discourse is related to the institutional details. And the, and, and the contrast of conceptions brings out the conflictual significance of the dispute about the details. So, so let, let me bring out, let me talk about another concrete example in a way that I think is maybe aligned with your argument. Okay. Uh, you mean about finance? So Danny said, Danny said it's, 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 it's a discussion about tactics and about details. What drives well, well let me this, this question of orthodoxy and heresy. Huh? So let me try this, and maybe th this will be maybe helpful to um, your question as well. So let, let's take an example of a country which, in fact, a rel relatively recent example, which um, you know, did employ a lot of local heresies uh, early on to very um, uh, successful um, effects. So this is South Korea. Um, and, and South Korea is an interesting example because it starts out in the early 60s, uh, both very extremely poor uh, and because it employs a, a lot of things which by today's, today's standards of orthodoxy uh, are things that you should not do in order to, to progress, to develop. In particular, a lot of trade protection, a lot of industrial policy, a lot of state involvement in the economy, highly sort of specific to South Korea. You know, most of these things probably wouldn't work in other countries, but they made it work. Um, and there was a particular political um, uh, context where it was a change from sort of, you know, sort of it was a way of fighting any potential threat from North Korea by developing a very strong economy that was going to be very strongly you know, relying on exports. So it was a milita military strategic political goal which is interpreted in, ter in economic terms and then the use of economic policy instruments 
which is a combination of orthodox and heterodox because the more, mostly macroeconomic policies were uh, orthodox, but a lot of microeconomic industrial policies were unorthodox. So this is where, so it starts out, and, 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 and it's a good example because we can see the evolution of the South Korean economy because it has developed so rapidly that already by today, for example, it's a country that's richer than Japan. It's more productive, it's become richer than Japan, having started at a level of income back in 1960, which was poorer than Ghana at the time. So what has happened to the policies and institutions? So, so is this in the long term, let's say in the um, you know, 50, 60 years of, of uh, this evolution, has South Korea turned into an economy that's an example of a universal heresy or an orthodoxy? I think the argument that is friendly to you would be to say, look at the chances that they um, waste. Because what did South Korea do? As they got richer, they became, they started to idolize uh, a kind of a, you know, idolized, you know, Western style um, uh, market economy. And their objective became to look as much <coughs> like a, a typical OECD economy as possible. So that meant becoming a member of the OECD, incorporating all the codes and, and conduct and other models from the OECD. It meant opening up to capital flows as part of OECD membership. And sort of one interpretation of the malaise of the South Korean economy today, and there's a huge malaise right, um, uh, in South Korea today, is that they wasted this opportunity of developing a better version of themselves. Instead, they uh, tried to emulate in the longer term, a kind of uh, a Western style market economy, which in practice has produced lower economic growth, has produced increasing inequality today, and significant amounts of social malaise. Now, I think the, the argument to, so what we're dis debating is, you know, the possibilities we're far, no, I think we largely agree on the sort of steps, on the to characterize the nature of the steps that an economy like South Korea undertook. Um, but perhaps we're disagreeing on the possibilities of a path that this economy might have, that might have been open to them and that they thought maybe they were for. Well, one question you can ask, what are the constraints on the development of the novelty? So taking the United States. So I said, what really created the United States was this combination of Hamilton's development project with this movement from below of selective democratization. Uh, all the presidents of the United States, down through Abraham Lincoln, viewed themselves as disciples of Alexander Hamilton. But that was only half of the story, because the other story was this movement from below. Uh, and why did that movement then not remain in American history? Why was it progressively weakened in subsequent episodes? It was weakened because of the combination of two constraints. One constraint was the weakness of politics, uh, the weakness of democracy, not having a high energy democracy. Uh, and that was the Americans idolized their constitution. It's part of the national identity. The constitution was deliberately designed by its authors to inhibit the transformation of society by politics. So there's a liberal principle of fragmentation of power. There's a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics, Madison's scheme of checks and balances. And the Americans believe mistakenly that these liberal and conservative principles are indissolubly connected. They're not. They're connected by design and by intention. Uh, and so it was the w it, that they, they had this proto-democratic liberalism is what the American Constitution established. And that's an inadequate basis to continue developing collective difference. The other constraint is the constraint of thought. They had these experiments in agriculture and in finance, but they never theorized them. They never developed the doctrine 
that a market order could have radically different forms. And your Korean example is an example of the same thing. I would say, what are the two major constraints on a society like South Korea? The inadequacy of its democracy and mental colonialism, as, as you described it. You know? So even a very great country like China, which thinks of itself as in a process of national ascendance and self-affirmation, can in fact be bent under the yoke of mental colonialism. Uh, and it is. I mean, you go to the Central Party School in Beijing, and what are they discussing there? They're discussing second and third rate American social science and policy discourse. They're not discussing alternative <laughs> doctrines. Huh? And that's mental colonialism. So uh, I think that those are the two, to me, those are the two greatest constraints on the development of the transformative potential of these heresies. Yeah, I, I see some hands, so I think this might be a good time yes. to maybe just uh, the old people. And yes, Mandla. Thank you, Prof. So, I mean, one of the, I think, the themes uh, that's come up in the last few weeks is the idea of having alternatives and offers itself under the kind of teaching for you. Um, and I think, uh, Dr. Arthur, you're also, you've also introduced it as well by saying, you keep highlighting that, you know, especially for developing countries, Many of the major developing countries have a source in short conflict about policy. But you've also said that um, the space to do so in this context is you know, going to be more limited in recent years. So I guess one of the things I'm trying to get out of this chat um, is understanding what are those possible alternatives. Um, obviously, up in South Africa, we're kind of have more developing country lens. What are the kind of different choices? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, I, I think those are issues that we will talk about. I think they are the things that uh, are, are hard to uh, talk about in, in particular context because, you know, they have to be contextual. But I, I, I think you were maybe a little bit too dismissive of, you know, sort of industrial policy and smart in intervention as, okay, now we know what that is and let's talk about other things. Because I think a lot of, there's a lot of action is really, you know, um, hidden under what that means. For example, in the context of South Africa today, I would say that, you know, industrial policy would, needs to have a significant shift from its current trajectory, which is largely has been to, uh, to promote um, some established manufacturing or other um, large firms, uh, such as in autos and so forth, uh, which now we know is not where the expansion of employment is going to come from. And if you look at the South African economy as the epitome of this problem of productive dualism that we've been talking about, where nearly 50% of the you know, sort of um, labor force is, um, certainly the youth is unemployed, you have to ask the question, where will those jobs be created? And they're not going to be created in the sectors of the economy which currently the South African industrial policy targets, which are the largest you know, tradable, um, you know, sort of um, more manufacturing sectors. So that gives you a completely different orientation for industrial policy, which is much more um, sort of services, small and medium-sized firms, um, and a much different locus for the conduct of industrial policy, which will not be the national government, but it will be municipal government or the, or the, or the provincial governments, uh, which are much more able to actually deal with the mass of small and medium-sized enterprises in a way that the national government cannot do so. And the mode of intervention becomes much less, you know, sort of subsidies or, or production or removal of red tape which are the things that might be of interest to the largest firms and the manufacturing, but very petty things at the level of small, medium-sized firms, such as zoning requirements or 
uh, different types of red tape or you know, sort of fees that they might be subjected to, thinking of creating platforms for sellers from you know, you know, digital platforms for smaller firms and so forth. It's a very different type of, of both engagement, different types of approach. But now that's only kind of thinking about you know, you know, starting a kind of a directional change of thinking. But al already in that example, I think one can see that you know, this notion of you know, new, you know, smart state intervention, and you, so it, it's, it's, there's a lot of issues there that you know, God knows South Africa has done a lot of industrial policy, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, it has worked and I, I think it requires a significantly direct difference. I think these issues will, will align with some of the other issues that we'll be talking about here. Um, so two, two major themes of this course, as we stated last week, are first, what are the alternative institutional forms of the market order? And second, specifically, what are the alternative features of the knowledge economy, the new advanced practice of production? And we are going to be developing programmatic ideas about those, ideas about the directions which they can or should take. But these can't be stated as abstract blueprints because then the discussion falls flat. It's lifeless. We have to engage with the actual material of historical diversity and political conflict in the world. And any real alternative has to be generated out of that. So, and furthermore, this is, this is a fragment of a much larger discussion of alternatives. This is just the economic part on which we're, on which we're focusing. But it's, it's, it's the beginning. I, so I'm absolutely certain that it would be a mistake of ours simply to profess general doctrines about alternatives without facing this reality of, like this discussion we're having today about these growth projects. That's the central stuff of history. That's what the world is on fire about. And so we have to engage it as it is. And that's the point of departure. But, but, but I, I do want to make a very quick point before I t we take more questions, because I think it's important to emphasize and we've understood. So we've talked about institutional uh, experimentation and divergence. And I think one issue that we brought up is that you know, you want to think about institutional diversity not simply as a transitional phenomenon. You want to think about institutional diversity as also something that you need to keep thinking about um, as a country develops. And I think some of the examples we've talked about is I think, you know, that, that uh, is, is that, okay, you, you know, y y you've done these heterodox things and you've grown and now you can think about how you can converge to some set of best practices. I think we agree that that's not the right way that's to think about right institutional yes. transformation. That you have to keep you have to keep having an open mind about institutional uh, diversity, and that's really an ongoing task. And and and, and, and sort of the, the you know the, the idea that there is going to be there's some set of best practice institutions through which you you will converge, I think is not very meaningful or very helpful. Um, but it is the idea that is enacted in the world. It's represented, for example, by the OECD. So Even the, the OECD is changing its mind, but, 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 I, but that's important. I think yeah. we are moving away from that, but, you know, but there is no general formulation. Uh, Kisimbi? Yes. So a quick question to the discussion around um, you know, the universal orthodoxy and, and local hierarchy and the compromise there that kind of has emerged. And one of the things, and maybe this is kind of the definition of this kind of intellectual, are these compromises struck at one point in time and kept in that way? Or are these the compromises that have to be struck periodically and over time? Because in essence, what we also see is that as you know, the Congress of Spirit in terms of what's happened with the Amazonian project and the betrayal, so to speak, of the slide, the discussion around the undermining or the weakening or the harm of the democratization process from below. Um, so societies change, and these interests do change, and even the citizenship and creation kind of interests change. So are we then describing kind of compromises as compromises that are stuck in time and then betrayed, basically, to now, regarding to where we are today now, or do we see this as an ongoing 
requires you know kind of constant renegotiation of those compromises or not? Well, I mean, of course it's ongoing. So time brings every political construction down into the dust. But it, it, it's not a continuum. So history is discontinuous. And there are these settlements. There are these decisive, formative moments in which a certain logic is established. And it then shapes the sequel. So that's the reality. You know, in these societies, uh, in the rich North Atlantic societies, the last great moment of institutional and ideological refoundation was the social liberal or social democratic settlement of the mid 20th century. And I believe that its terms now are inadequate to solve or even to address any of the fundamental structural problems of these societies. So we're in the long shadow of that receding settlement. And in that context, in that shadow, we're discussing what are the alternative ways of organizing the system of production. Yes. I mean, an emergency, a national emergency. So, so all the democracies that exist in the world, I think, are weak democracies. That's the only kind of democracy we have, these flawed, weak democracies. All of them continue to make crisis the enabling condition of change. If there's no crisis, there's no change, as you just said. Uh, that's how they're organized. Uh, and so, uh, we would have to have a different kind of democracy, a different kind of democratic politics that made change less dependent on crisis than it now is. Huh? Uh, and then the objection would be, but any institutional reform that made change depend on crisis, uh, that, that diminished the dependence of change on crisis, would itself depend on crisis. So there's a vicious circle and we think that that vicious circle has to be broken by the imagination. The imagination, the, the task of the imagination is to do the work of crisis without crisis. Uh, uh, so, but. So, I mean, I, 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 so I think one common view is to think that um, there is a sort of sort of vested powerful interests which are preventing change and therefore it's hard to imagine how change happens other than through crisis. I, th I think my view is that that significantly uh, um, underestimates the importance of ideas because even the notion of a crisis is always relative to what could have happened. Uh, that is to say we're in a crisis now because we could have, in fact, done so much better. And the role of ideas is to, I think, present some plausible vision of what that alternative is, and therefore to suggest, and also to suggest a way of getting there. So the, the closely allied idea is the no, is notion is that, in fact, these, you have to ask the question, where do those powerful vested interests get their ideas from? And part of that is that they're getting their ideas from established thought. Um, so, you know, before I think Roberto gave the example of two industrialists, you know, Alfred Sloan and Henry Ford, that had two very different ideas about what the objective of the corporation is. Those are, you know, so, that, so you know, and so the notion that there is a set of vested interests that are frozen, that are independent of ideas about how to organize society. Um, doesn't make sense. And so there's always this set of there's background ideas, mostly established orthodox conventional ideas, which help these powerful groups define where their interests are. Uh, and that can, yes, if there's no change in the background ideas, 
those set of you know, consolation of vested interests and powerful interests might act as a constraint on change. But that's at least, you know, half of it is at least, you know, you know, the poverty of ideas that we're putting in front of them. So I think, I think we both believe in the you know, transformative potential of ideas and that's in fact one way of unlocking this you know, paralysis is to be able to inject new ideas about how you can move. Ideas that um, you know, might move the elites themselves in that particular direction. So any, a, f a fundamental example of that kind is, is the idea that a free society has a single natural form or not? The, does a free society have a definite institutional form? So th the whole model of ideological conflict in the world for the last 200 years has been the state versus the market. More market, less state, more state, less market, compromise of market and state. That was social liberalism and social democracy. And now we might think that a new kind of ideological conflict is emerging in the world, the subject of which is what are the alternative institutional forms of the market order, of democratic politics, and of an independent civil society? That's a different idea. And that idea leads to a transformation of our understanding of class interests, of group interests. Well, we have to go to the details. So what parts of the Washington, of the so-called Washington Consensus are necessary to preserve? Huh? So as, as I said before in the exchange we had, if you take fiscal austerity, you can have fiscal austerity, but accept it for the reasons opposite to the reasons for which it's in the Washington Consensus. In the Washington Consensus, it's there to implement the discipline of capital. Do what the financial markets want. And here, the instruction is exactly the opposite. D act in such a way that you don't have to pay any attention to the financial markets. So on the surface, it's the same, but functionally, it's completely different. It has the opposite intention. In the back. Well, I'll give you the example of my country, of Brazil, because it's an extreme example of being bent under the yoke of, of mental colonialism. So they're, they're basic, the intelligentsia, as in much of the world, is divided into two camps. There's a neo-Marxist camp, which has received from the zeitgeist a, 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 a little ax. It's cut Marxism in half. It's thrown out the good part, the transformative aspirations, and it's kept the bad part, the historical fatalism. So that's half of the intelligentsia. Then the other half of the intelligentsia is in the process of importing and imitating this second-rate American social science and policy discourse. Uh, uh, and with, this is another part of the chorus of fate. So that's what we have. And that's an example of mental colonialism. So 
it's, it, it's an inability to understand structure and structural possibility. Huh? Uh, the, the, the real object always in any kind of inquiry is the relation between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible. To understand something is to understand what it can become. Otherwise, you don't understand it. And uh, this, is, this is generally what we have in the world. We have social science as a kind of retrospective rationalization of established reality. Uh, and imported mental colonialism. Uh, so you have to be able to think and rebel and have your own ideas. Uh, and then this then creates the, the potential to illuminate these alternative national trajectories. But, but this mental, col mental colonialism affects the, uh, the, the intellectual elites of uh, North America and, and, and Europe to a good extent, no? It has a different form, to be sure, because, but it, it's, uh, I mean, in, in the case of a country like Brazil, it's aggravated because our ideas aren't even our own. They're, they're all imported. Uh, and uh, that makes it worse. Yeah. I mean, from the outside, it seems to me that actually there's, there's some ideas in Brazil that, you know, like developmentalism, uh, that, that still has survived. Um, there's a certain diversity of opinion that's much uh, more marked than what I see in, in, in the U.S. and so forth. But maybe we'll just take one. Um, one yeah. 